okay? It's a sermon that was preached 49 years ago. And uh, so I'll have to hasten to get through it. But it's uh, so fitting for today. And it's entitled, America, Wake Up. The world needs you. You ever give that any thought? This was 49 years ago when he preached this message. Of course, he uh, uh, may have updated some stuff in here, but this is Dr. W.K. McCowan. Uh, I read a lot of messages and get a lot of information from other folks as not use them, corp incorporate them with my messages so many times. But this, and I'm just going to read it to you just for the sake of time. What's it titled again? America, wake up. Okay. The world needs you. Dr. Thank McComas you. preached this message in Rittman, Ohio, 49 years ago. But it is so up to date, you'll think it was preached just yesterday. Let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer and ask his blessings upon this time together. And I trust that it'll be something in here. It's more of an informational thing, but it's also... Uh, to alert us uh, what, a, what a time we need to truly be in prayer for our country. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the day and for you watch care of us. Thank you for the privilege that we have to share tonight. And we ask, Lord, that you'd use this uh, message by Dr. McComas tonight, Lord, to speak to our hearts. Lord, help us to realize that, uh, as we stated in our message this morning, that you're always there with us and uh, living within us, so we're to be the channel for you to flow through that others might see your love and your mercy that's available to all mankind, especially those that don't know you as Lord and Savior of their life. And Lord, thank you for the assurance that we have because of a relationship with you. May you be honored, may you be glorified, and may our hearts rejoice in you tonight. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, I'm just going to start this, and the scripture that he uses for this, everyone hear me okay? In Romans uh, chapter 13, I preached in this passage of scripture not long ago, but Romans chapter 13, verse 11 and verse 12. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to wake out of sleep. For now is our <clears throat> salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Sleeping, he says, is an act of of the most natural kind. The disciples of Jesus said concerning Lazarus, if he sleep, he shall do well. Remember that in John chapter 11, verse 32. Psychologists tell us no human being can live very long without sleep. Sleep is a temporary escape from the pressures of life. The Bible, however, contains many statements warning against sleeping at the wrong time. In the last public discourse of Jesus, with great emphasis, he said, watch, lest coming suddenly, I find you sleeping, sleeping in Mark chapter 11. He taught a parable that involved 10 virgins who were watching. Let me uh, make sure I get on the right page here. They were watching for the coming bridegroom. He illustrated the, the sad results which come from sleeping when we should be watching. America needs to heed the admonition of Paul, the apostle, when he said, it is high time to awake out of sleep. What a heritage of noble men has America. During World War I, 
A member of the State Council of Defense in Illinois City received a stack of patriotic papers, which were accompanied by a request to post them over town. The help of an older, over enthusiastic teenager was enlisted to assist in the project. He was instructed to post the papers everywhere he found a dead wall. Later in the day, the official was called to the local cemetery on the tomb of one of the city's founding fathers. He found the poster, which read, wake up citizen, your country needs you. If it were possible, I would like to awaken some of America's founding fathers with the plea, your country needs you. If they should awaken, I would like to express my appreciation to those brave men who purchased my freedom at Bunker Hill, Gettysburg, New Orleans, Normandy Beach, Pearl Harbor, and Iwo Jima. I'd also like to say thanks to the men who died on a barren ridge in Korea or in a slimy jungle of faraway Vietnam. I'm grateful to God when I think of the patience he gave to George Washington, the wisdom he gave to Franklin, the compassion he gave to Lincoln, the vision he gave to Jefferson, and the courage he gave to the unknown soldier. It can be said of them as it was said of Abel. He being dead yet speaketh. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse four. I can almost hear those gallant men saying, I've not yet begun to fight. I only regret I have but one life to give my country. America has been a friend to the world, but she's been betrayed by many so-called friends across both the Atlantic and Pacific. My hat is off to the brave men who signed the historical document in behalf of the people of the 13 colonies. They pledged their fortunes, sacred honor, and very lives for their God-given convictions. Their homes were ransacked. Their families were tortured and threatened. Physical brutality, and in many cases death, was the price paid for the Declaration of Independence. America needs another Boston Tea Party and a new Declaration of Independence. That means we're just declared, declared the independence. I don't know about you, but I still thrill at the sight of old glory. I get a lump in my throat each time I enthusiastically pledge allegiance to the flag. When the Declaration of Independence was 38 years old and Brit British militiamen were tramping again on the rebellious soil of the colonies here in America, our national anthem was written. It happened that on the night of the 13th of September, 1814, a young United States lawyer, Francis Scott Key, secured permission to board a British frigate in an attempt to arraign, arrange the release of an American prisoner detained on the ship. Key was forced to stay overnight on the ship while it threw volley after volley of cannon fire into the American fort, which guarded the entrance to Baltimore. In the dwindling light of day, he could see the American flag flying <clears throat> over Fort McHenry. And as the dark settled over the harbor, he watched intently to see <clears throat> if the proud banner still flew. The red glare of exploding ammunition would occasionally bring old glory into view. When the gray dawn broke, the morning sunlight seemed to wash the smoke of Fort McHenry away 
and the silver stars and the red stripes wore the new look of courage. The long, young lawyer was so moved that he pulled an old letter out of his pocket and wrote on the back of the letter a poem which he called The Defense of Fort McHenry. Here's what he wrote. <clears throat> oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we held at the twilight's last gleaming? whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. When I see the 13 stripes, I'm reminded of the struggle of the 13 colonies. When I look at the 50 stars, I'm reminded that there are 50 sovereign states in the United States our forefathers bought freedom for. It's easy for me to pledge allegiance to a flag whose red reminds me of courage, sacrifice, and valor. It's easy for me to pledge allegiance to the flag whose blue reminds me of loyalty, vigilance, perseverance, and justice, and whose white reminds me of purity, innocence, and liberty. I can and I do pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States and to the Republic for which it stands. Our fathers knew only God could keep America. In my mind's eye, I can see George Washington, James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, John Adams and Benjamin Franklin seated at the conference table of the State House of, at Philadelphia, the year is 1787. Delegates are arriving late due to inclement weather. Small states wanted equal representation to the larger ones. The larger states wanted representation on a population ratio. Agreement seemed an impossible goal for that gathering. The atmosphere and complexion of that meeting were suddenly changed when Benjamin Franklin arose and spoke in tones of urgency. Gentlemen, I have lived a long time and I'm convinced that God governs the affairs of men. If a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? I move that prayers imploring the assistance of heaven be held each morning before we proceed with business. After prayer, those founding fathers drafted a document assuring freedom to all Americans. We need to listen to what our founding fathers had to say. Daniel Webster stood at Freiburg, Maine, July the 4th, 1802 and said, I dare not undertake to assure you that your liberties and your happiness may not be lost. Men are subject to men's misfortunes. If an angel should be winged from heaven on an errand of mercy to our country, the first accents that would glow on his lips would be, beware, be cautious. You have everything to lose. You have nothing to gain. We live under the only government that ever existed, which was framed by the unrestrained and the deliberate consultations of the people. Miracles do not cluster. That which has happened but once in 6,000 years cannot be expected to happen often. Such a government once gone, 
might leave a void to be filled for ages with revolution and tumult, riot, and deputism. <clears throat> Another caption, lawlessness, radicals mean to ruin America. Remember the title of this message? America, wake up. To our sad dismay, the day has arrived when we're seeing the administration of justice collapse. The slogan of the radical left is <clears throat> free all political prisoners. May I ask you, when will we stop glorifying criminals and making a laughing stock of our courts? A Civil War soldier was halted by a sentinel near a sluggish pool of water after he had soaped himself and was about to plunge in. What you halting me for, demanded the soldier. He says, you can't go in there, said the sentinel. Why can't I go in there? Cause the general said so. Said that water was given the soldiers chills and fever. Well, why didn't you tell me before I soaked myself? Because the order is not against soldiers soaping themselves, it's against going in the water. May I say, there is no law against our citizens soaping themselves in foreign radicalism. There is a law, however, written in the heart and conscience of every freedom-loving American against bathing in the limpid waters of pure democracy with polluted bodies that will contaminate the stream of liberty and kill us all. Christianity made America great. It's time we reconsider what made America great. Her greatness doesn't lie in her great culture and wealth. All the great empires of antiquity were great in these areas. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Egypt, Greece, and Rome, all in the ash heap of destruction today because they took three steps downward. Spiritual apostasy, moral decay, and political anarchy. America has traveled a long way down that same road. The flaming hearted pioneer preacher was used of God in laying the foundation for free America. He went into the wilderness frontier, having no lodging place or change of garments traveling by horseback and foot over Indian trails. He forded the rivers, was exposed to storms and prostrated by fevers. He constantly fought the beak and claw of poverty's vultures. His total library consisted of a tattered hymn book and a well-worn Bible. Evangelism has changed to institutionalism. The preacher's message today is recreation, education, and legislation. A great deal is said from the pulpit about civil rights, which are often civil, civil wrongs. The modern preacher cannot say with Paul the apostle, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. You're familiar with that text in Romans 1, 16. He knows no, nothing. We're talking about the modern preacher knows nothing about God's power. I glory in the spunk of John Leland, a Baptist preacher who in the 18th century fought gallantly in the struggle for religious freedom. Leland met James Madison under an oak tree near Orange, Virginia. He there pledged his support to Madison, providing 
he would present amendments to the Constitution guaranteeing religious freedom. Too many clergymen have linked hands and lain in the streets with agitators that would refuse to be appeased even if the social order of the whole country was uprooted in conformance to their dictates. I sometimes wonder why that lady we know as the Statue of Liberty doesn't turn about face, descend to her pedestal, extinguish her torch in the briny waters of the Atlantic, bow her face in the sand and cry out in despair from the acts of high treason going on behind her. The word freedom is being battled around like a ball on a tennis court by those who would destroy it and have no idea of its price. When James Russell Lowell was asked how long America will remain the land of the free, he answered, as long as the ideas of her founding fathers remain dominant. We have come to the place where America is the home of the spree and the land of rave, hysteria and pandemonium rule the mob violence on the street. Albert Einstein said the churches were only the only opposition to Hitler and Nazism in Europe. Political strategists and the great institutions of learning wilted like cut lettuce leaves in the sun. They were blown asunder like a straw in a tornado. Arnold J. Tornaby said, the power of the gospel is the only thing that will give a living faith to a dying civilization. Ladies and gentlemen, God is the only hope for America on socialism and communism as socialism and communism move as steadily, stealthily, as a serpent in the right night to destroy our liberty. What happened in America? Does some new power rule whose force is felt in home and church and even in the school? If I express my loyalty for what I hold so dear, I'm prejudiced, a stubborn fool, and even insincere. If I stand up <clears throat> against the wrong, as Christ would bid me stand, I'm scoffed and ridiculed. Folks just don't understand. And even when I talk to God, who answers when I pray, they look at me and laugh again. Oh, it's just luck, they say. Yet still with Christ, I take my stand against endless criticism and fight the foe with all my might the power of godless communism. Wake up, America, wake up. My plea is, America, wake up. The world needs you. America has been emulating Rip Van Winkle much too long. I find great opposition, however, to my efforts of trying to awaken this sleeping nation People try to shut me up. Don't talk too loudly, they say. <clears throat> Just let the baby sleep. We're safe and all is well. Besides, nobody likes a loud mouth fundamental alarmist. They pretend they are in paradise, in a paradise free from problems. There are four definite and distinct cries being made to America since everyone is talking at the same time. Some get the idea everyone is saying the same thing. Listen closely to what they are saying. Learn, earn, burn, turn. Which will she heed? One segment says learn. Education is the answer. 
Another segment says earn, economic development is our need. Still another group cries, burn, baby, burn. I fall into the class of a vast minority crying out America, turn before it's too late. I remind you of that classic verse that says, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Second Chronicles 7, 14. In the 19th century, some European ministers came to the United States in an effort to ascertain the American ideal. They said, I sought for her greatness in the genius of her inventions, commodious harbors, ample rivers, and great industry. But her greatness I did not find. I sought in her fertile fields, boundless prairies, and great cities, but until I entered her churches and heard the message of hope ring out to a hopeless world, I didn't find her greatness. At Dover, England, three harbor lights are used to guide the ships past the rocks. The pilot must maneuver the ship in line with the lights so they appear as one. The ship of state will be safe when the home school, and church line up with God and they all appear as one. John Witherspoon was a fundamental Presbyterian preacher, a brilliant man, a great orator, a true American, and one of the first signers of the Declaration of Independence. Several men had wanted to, to sign but were afraid because they knew they were signing their death warrant. John Witherspoon made a daring challenge, daring and challenging speech before the Continental Congress. As a result, John Hancock could hardly wait for him to finish so he could sign the document. He later went one night to hear John Witherspoon preach. As his text, Witherspoon used the words, of Jesus. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. John 10 and 9. On the way home, Hancock spoke with friends and said, I've always enjoyed hearing John Witherspoon speak, but tonight he left me mystified. He said Jesus was a door and that I, and that I don't understand. He arrived home in the dark, felt for the door handle several times before he located it, then opened the door and stepped inside. Still thinking of the preacher's message, he spoke out loud, now I see. His family sitting around the fire laughed. One remarked, sure you can see, you've been out in the dark. You just opened the door and came into the light. Of course you can see. John Hancock then said, by faith, I have also laid hold of another door that opened into light and life eternal. He had put his name on the Declaration of Independence, and now his name had been recorded on a far more important document called the Lamb's Book of Life. My dear friend, you can't get your name on the Declaration of Independence, but I'm happy to inform you that you can have your name entered into the Lamb's Book of Life by trusting in the blood of the Lamb that was slain on Calvary's cross. Whosoever will may come. Mercy's door is still open. And he ends with asking the question, will you enter in? That was so full of truths, things that affect our nation today and declaring how that 
we must. We must. Especially as children of God, we must emphasize and show the light of Christ in this dark world. There's no hope for America. There's no hope for England. There's no hope for Russia. There's no hope for any nation on this world or any group of people. There's no hope outside of Jesus Christ. If anyone plans to go to heaven, wants to go to heaven, the only way is through Jesus Christ. Down through the years, a lot of this history that we shared in some of these things tonight and the Declaration of Independence and our Star Spangled Banner Scott Francis Key, so many that have contributed down through the years for us to enjoy what we enjoy tonight, today, in this world today. The freedoms that we enjoy, the sacrifices that have been made by many who were willingly being used and are still being used, volunteering in our military to protect America and the rights of people to freedom, freedom of religion, freedom to choose. The problem that we have today, as I've said so many times, I'll say it again. The problem is we do have a choice. A man can make a right choice or he can make the wrong choice. America can make a good choice or it can make a bad choice. America can choose to do right, or it can choose to rebel against God and do wrong. And the consequences are great. We recognize as children of God, that God is our only hope, that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And I trust tonight that we will be motivated in the time of so much darkness in our world and so much conflict and people rebelling against truth and right and morals in our country, that the church will wake up. As a matter of fact, there's another message in here that I read that I wish to, uh, I may share with you later, but it's entitled, Is There Not a Cause? He starts off by saying God can still build churches today and he can still do great works today. It's up to us to yield to him. We have such a rich heritage in our churches, true churches today. I'm glad to be a part of the kingdom of God and kingdom's work. Aren't you glad that God has called you and separated you to be light in a dark world. Help us to be sensitive to the fact that all around us are those that don't know Jesus Christ as a personal savior. They don't realize and know the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we must get that message to the world. And that's the church's business today to share the love and the mercy and the grace of Jesus Christ in God. Well, I just said, ain't God good. God is good. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this time together tonight. And Lord, thank you for this message that we shared many years ago and then brought up to date to today. Thank you, Lord, for the heritage that we have. And thank you, Lord, for the hope that we have. Thank you for the freedom that we enjoy because of men who were not afraid but we're willing to go so far as to give their own lives. Lord, for the freedom of this nation. But Lord, most of all tonight, I want to thank you for giving your life on the cross of Calvary that we might have eternal life to last forever and forever. And I pray that anybody that has not received Christ as their personal savior, help us to be sensitive to their need. 
to their misunderstanding so that they might understand and see the light of life and come to know Jesus as their personal Savior. Help us to know that that's our business. And thank you, Lord, for putting us in the business of reaching the world for Christ. Lord, just uh, go with us through this week. Use us, Lord, to bring honor and glory to your name. And Lord, to be a help to someone else that's in need. Lord, we love you and we thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, folks, for joining in, and I hope that you got a little something out of that message tonight. I did. I just enjoyed it because it's got so much history, so much uh, in it that uh, uh, makes us realize how blessed we are. Uh, America has a lot of flaws, but America is still the greatest country anywhere. Amen. Amen. Amen.